We are live. It is one of those days where internet goes off, Wi-Fi password won't work, all kinds of uh, things. That's why I said if I can get my shit together, we could do this brief weekly live cast. Welcome to Crypto Law TV. I'm John Deaton. I'm the founder and your host. Um, we have big plans in a couple weeks. I'll get to that at the end. But we're going to talk about the Hinman documents first and what to be expected, because there are a, there's just a lot of confusion about what's going on. OK, just to bring everybody up to speed, Judge Torres has ordered that the Hinman emails, draft speeches and the comments between all these SEC personnel, that that cannot be sealed, that that must be released to the public with very limited redactions. OK, so basically we're going to get to see on June 13th. It's possible it's a day before, but doubt it. Uh, basically, the drafts with the red lines and, and the comments that Hinman made and that Valerie S. made and that the Office of General Counsel made and all these other people made related to this speech. It is going to be released on the 13th of June. A lot of people made a big deal about why would Ripple agree to a one week extension to unseal this. And my comment to that was, I don't think there's going to be any kind of appeal or any writ of mandamus by the SEC because the SEC filed a letter to the judge that said, look, judge, we need an extra week to make sure that we comply with your order. And so I doubt very seriously if they would say that to the judge and then pull a fast one and try to file a writ or object or any of that kind of stuff. And so the bottom line is we're going to see these documents. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, we're going to get to see what Joe Lubin said or Mike Novogratz. No, this, these are SEC personnel emails. If anyone was on the email chain that did not work at the SEC, then they could have never argued attorney-client privilege. They could have never argued deliberative process privilege. So these are the emails. So let's talk first about what started off a footnote that I put out earlier, and it was Exhibit 220, and it's in a footnote in Ripple's opposition brief. And basically what it said at the bottom of the, uh, of the footnote, it basically said, it cited SEC lit emails. Now, if you see underneath that, you'll see redactions at the bottom of the footnote in the next footnote. And it also cites SEC lit emails. Those are the, the designation abbreviation of the Hinman documents. But what's not redacted is that someone said there are, quote, reasonable grounds to conclude that XRP does not satisfy all elements of the Howey analysis and is therefore not a security for purposes of the federal securities laws. But that's not redacted. So I want to back up and go to pay the page previous so we could read the footnote. And that's on the, file, the page before. And the footnote where that citation is made, the sentence says, other market participants independent from Ripple likewise sent the SEC independent analyses often prepared by reputable law firms concluding that XRP was not a security. And then you see footnote 33. And then when you look down at the bottom, it has a different site. It says SEC lit e-production, which are not the Hinman emails. And then it talks about what this person said, some manager who said that Bitcoin, ETH, and XRP uh, should not be governed by the securities laws. And so what this means is that someone, not an SEC official, commented about how SEC, the Ripple, um, excuse me, XRP does not satisfy the Howey test. And that comment is contained within the Hinman emails. In other words, it appears that an SEC official either forwarded an email from the SEC, that the SEC received 
or was citing what this other person, independent of Ripple, was saying as they were discussing this speech, this monumental speech that was to be given. And so let's look at what you can expect because we have a very good guide. And what we have, and I wanna bring it up, it's A1. It is a document. I wanna explain to everybody what this is. Basically, as you can read, it's a summary chart of the entries of the SEC privilege log. And when, and this is basically, you know, seven pages and uh, we'll get to the end in a minute, but this is what you can see, right? It starts off at the very top, an email from Fredrickson who worked for Hinman about the speech. The second entry is we see the, not the second page, but the second entry of the first page, it says email from Fredrickson to Seaman attaching the first rough draft of the speech. You can see it there in bold in the very second line. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the first draft. We're going to get to see what was the very first draft. Now, I know a lot of people out there are speculating, is XRP in it? Is it just ETH and Bitcoin? Uh, is there any suggestion? I have no idea. I'm not going to speculate. I'm just letting you know that's where it begins. That date is May 21st. And then you see the next entry down underneath is where Hinman's first comments. It says email from Hinman, Hinman to Fredrickson Seaman attaching comments on the first draft. We're going to get to read Bill Hinman's very first intake and his thoughts on what that first draft speech had to say. And then you just, it just keeps going on. The next entry over the next entry, you'll see there May 25th, uh, Valerie S., who is the crypto czar, she gets a copy of the draft. And then there's a May 25th draft. Now let's go to A2, which is the second page of this privilege log. And you'll see there on the second line, it says, right, just above 11, uh, I don't think you can see if you can read it, but it's an email from Henry, Hinman to those people within the finance depart, uh, corporation finance department making comments about the May 29 draft. So now we have another comment and then you move down and you get to June 1st and there's another comment from uh, email from Hinman with additional comments and each person is giving comments as it gets this email moves along at the bottom of a two, you see that there's a June 1st draft. And here we have Hinman's comments. And then we have Valerie S's comments to Hinman's comments. And it just keeps going on and on like this. If you get to a three, you'll see that at the very top, right? Entry number 20 on June 4th, it's an email from Seaman to Hinman Fredrickson, Sir Spasniak, attaching a new draft with the red lines of what was to be omitted. What's being omitted at this stage? We don't know, but we're going to find out. Uh, then you'll see on June 4th, there's a suggestion to get input of other divisions. You see there a list for other divisions and offices. And then we go to a line where it says 24 on the left, June 4th. We see an email from Hinman to Makowitz, Merman, Fox. This is office of the chair, Jay Clayton's office. You also see the enforcement division is being brought into it. You also see that it says uh, Redfern. Who is Brett Redfern? Well, he was the director of trading and markets. And thanks to Digital Asset Investor, I have a clip here. Let's look and see what Redfern said on June 7th. Chairman declined to say whether Ether or Ripple were actual securities, but is it fair to say that this is likely ultimately going to be litigated in the courts? Uh, it's unclear to me whether or not that's going to be litigated, and I don't want to speak about any specific products, and I do believe that there will be statements on at least one of those products forthcoming in the future about, you know, providing some more, more guidance on that. The chairman... Okay, notice that. So that was June 7th. Right. That we learned that Rhett, June 7th, 
one week before the Hinman speech is delivered at the Yahoo conference. So we look and we learn that on June 4th, that's when Brett Redfern learned of this speech, apparently in the email list. He may have heard about it, but that's when he got to see what was being suggested. And he made comments. In fact, some of his comments are actually cited in the Ripple brief. All right, I'm gonna let's go back for a second so I can let bring this full circle to people. If we can go back to uh, to the footnote and and uh, page 47, right? All right, you see there. Go back to page, the the one previous, right there. You see where it says contemporaneous SCC officials. That is Brett Redfern being quoted, but we see what's it's being redacted. Now, I believe that what was redacted is it's going to lead to market confusion or more confusion, or it could be speculation. I don't know we're going to see, but that is someone, that's an example of what we're going to read that Brett Redfern said. Now, let's go back to our privilege log where we were. We were on A3. And you'll see that if you go down to the bottom of A3, there's an email from the office of the chair um, of Jay Clayton that's forwarding him his June 4th email. So Charlie Gasparino and Ellie Tarnett has stated publicly that Jay Clayton's office had submitted input on this speech. Well, we're going to find out. That's the kind of stuff that we get to read. Um, go to A4. And then you'll see there on where it says 31 on the left, an email from Fredrickson attaching the comments in response to Brett Redfern's June 7th comments. So we've got the comments from Brett Redfern that this is, speech is going to lead to some kind of something, confusion, speculation, whatever the redacted word is. And you have people responding to his concern. And so are they corroborating his concern? Are they saying this speech shouldn't be given? What other things are they saying? Are they asking about XRP or other digital assets? And then if you look down on line 35, you'll see there's an email from the Office of General Counsel. And the Office of General Counsel is making comments on this speech. Boy, there's a lot of people at the SEC giving input on this personal opinion of Bill Hinman. OK, now everybody, I think, has a good idea of basically uh, the last thing I'd say about a four is if you go down to line 36, it literally says that the revised draft incorporated the comments from the Office of General Counsel trading markets and the investment uh, uh, markets or whatever that IM stands for. Um, therefore, they're, they're saying there's something in the speech was revised to accommodate those comments. We're going to find out what those were. So let's finally go to A7 so that people can see this is basically a summary of the privilege log. The bottom, it lays out who's uh, in the emails. But I want you to draw your attention to uh, the first line there. The second sentence says, Attachment 1 indicates the 64 non-duplicative documents reflected on the SEC privilege log. I've been saying there's 63 emails. I misspoke. There's 64, apparently. Uh, I also misspoke. I think I said there were 56 or 58 drafts. There are actually 52 because you can see in the second line, it says in total, there are 52 unique drafts reflected in uh, all of these Hinman emails. And so with that said, that, that's it for the documents. Uh, with that said is now you've got a good idea of what we're going to see uh, we don't know um, all of the comments, obviously. We don't know whether XRP was a, in a draft or not a draft. There's a lot of speculation about that. I don't necessarily believe that XRP was actually in a draft. Um, if, it, if it was, it's huge news. 
Uh, because remember, there was a memo at the SEC dated 2013, uh, excuse me, June 13th, 2018, that dealt with XRP. So apparently at the same time between May 21st or mid-May and June 13th, when this speech is being drafted and commented on by various people at the SEC, enforcement lawyers at the SEC were dealing with XRP, which is further corroboration that XRP was probably mentioned somewhere in all of these comments. After all, it had battled ETH for the number two spot in January of 2018. XRP was number two. On June 13th, 2018, it was number three as far as market cap. Uh, XRP had existed before uh, ETH. It was mentioned by the uh, Government Accountability Office in 2014 as a virtual currency utilized in a decentralized payment platform called Ripple. In 2015, FinCEN declared it virtual convertible virtual currency and made Ripple comply with the banking laws, not the SEC laws. Also in the footnote, you notice a MoneyGram reference. MoneyGram declared in 2019 that they were going to utilize XRP and the SEC told them to count it as a contra expense as part of instead of revenue. They didn't say treat it as a security. We, there's a reference to Coinbase email in February 2019 that says, hey, XRP is not a security. All of that is evidence. And how these individuals at the SEC were dealing with these issues, we're going to find out. But that XRP memo is not a coincidence, people, that it's dated on June 13th, 2018, the day before. And the final comment about that is that memo could not have declared XRP a security because if it had then the enforcement lawyers would have recommended at least a cease and desist or letter to Ripple. Hey, Ripple, we just did this exhaustive memo and XRP's of security. Stop violating the law. They would have done at least that or they'd have recommended enforcement. They wouldn't have done nothing, which is what they did. So all of this evidence, I think, bodes well for Ripple. But more importantly, my concern is a secondary market and XRP holders. And I think that uh, we're going to find out. So hopefully you have a good idea of, of the nature of the documents now and what's contained in there or could be contained in there and not to be confused with the Empower Oversight emails that they're fighting for that deals with SEC communications with third parties, with Consensus or Vitalik or Joe Lubin or anybody else. Those are independent uh, emails. These are the internal emails of the SEC that they fought so hard. Um, I'd be remiss not to bring up that Coinbase file today. They're... Um, their reply brief on their writ of mandamus. And man, uh, people don't understand why that was such a good offensive move because basically I'll bring up um, something that the SEC said, uh, and that was on page four of their reply brief, where they say the agency remarkably seeks to distance itself from public statements by its own chair, contending that he cannot act or apparently even attest to the commission's plans or priorities, not even when testifying before Congress. They state on the next page, they sum it up perfectly. The SEC is talking out of both sides of its mouth and it is wrong at each end. Very powerful. So even if Coinbase were to technically lose this writ of mandamus, it doesn't matter because this is more evidence. Remember in the Ripple case, the Coinbase in their brief cites how the SEC lawyers told Ripple that Chairman Clayton's speeches were guidance to try to strike their fair notice defense. And then they turn around in a new case and say, oh, you're to ignore what the SEC chairs. 
These are the reasons why a federal judge stated that the lawyers at the SEC are hypocrites and they lack faithful allegiance to the law. Now, let me tell you, in a couple of weeks, on June 13th is a Tuesday. That's when the Hinman documents are going to be released. We're going to move Crypto Law's weekly live stream to Wednesday to give us time. And I'm going to have a star panel uh, with me to go over those emails. So look forward to that. With that said, everybody have a good week.